Welcome to Debut Spotlight. I'm Rachel Barenbaum, author of A Bend in the Stars. And today I'm here with Matteo Escarapor, who is the author of Black Buck. This book just dropped. It's unbelievably good. It's getting all the attention it deserves. Matteo, tell me, what is your book about? Wow. Uh, thank you for having me, Rachel. So Black Buck is about a young man named Darren. He's 22. He's living in Bedside, Brooklyn with his mom. He has his best friend. He has his girlfriend and his neighborhood and his neighborhood has him. So he's working in a Starbucks in Midtown Manhattan. And one day this suave, white, good looking CEO comes in and he says, yeah, man, just give me my regular. But for some reason, Darren says no. And he sells him on another drink. So this CEO, his name is Rhett Daniels. He invites Darren up to his startup on the 36th floor. The startup is called Someone. Darren reluctantly joins, but he soon realizes he's not the only black salesman there. He's the only black person in the entire company. So he goes through hell in order to make it to the top. And once there, he realizes he doesn't like being the token black dude. So he hatches a plan to help people of color infiltrate America's tech startup sales team, redefining what it means to be a minority in the workplace. So this book has been called Darkly Comic, it is, um, and it is packed with racial slurs um, and some, you know, shocking, horrible scenes, but it all starts with the title itself. And, mm -hmm. you know, Black Buck, of course, has a meanings on many, many levels. Can you talk about the title? Yeah, so um, first and foremost, it's the historical context. Uh, the Black Buck was the enslaved uh, person typically the enslaved male who the enslavers believed was unruly, untamable, was going to burn down the plantation, steal their women, um, really just get, get wild, right, or get buck. Um, and while Darren in this book isn't burning down uh, startup workplace or, or the corporate um, environment, he is burning down what it symbolizes. So that first and foremost was my aim with the title. Secondly, um, Darren is a black man. He's renamed Buck. That's the second meaning. The third is black buck representing uh, black and brown wealth and being able to accrue some through getting a better job, asking for more money, you know, helping out our communities. And the fourth is that Darren, you know, he used to work at Starbucks. So he's renamed Buck for short. Um, so the, the title has many meanings um, for myself and readers may take away more for themselves as well. And also, of course, there's Clyde who says Darren's going to make them a million bucks. Right. Like, exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh my yeah. God. Did people push back on the title? Initially, no. And then I eventually did get an email um, with people asking just for more information on how I came up with it, how I chose it. And I gladly provided that information. I actually wrote a small essay because there was no way in hell that I was going to change the title. Um, and then they received that. They were they were uh, satisfied. And then months later, we did a private bookseller seminar and a man, um, I really appreciated him bringing this up. He told me that some of his booksellers feel a little bit uncomfortable um, with the title. And I said, I, I understand. I reiterated why, why I chose it. And he was satisfied. That's all he needed to hear. So. I'm glad that I'm glad you stuck with it and stuck it through because um, I just think it sets the tone for the whole book. You know, it really exactly. encompasses it. So I thought that was great. Um, so uh, on the subject of starting the book, right, we're now with the title. I want to take us to like page two where we you have some of my favorite advice in the book. And it comes from your urban corner philosopher come fairy god uncle Wally Cat. Mm -hmm. Um, I love that description of him. And that is your writing in a nutshell. And uh, he says, you can change the hands of a clock, but you can't change time. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? What does that mean? Because that, for me, that sort of summed up a great, a big part of this book. Well, it's that you can try to change who you are um, on the surface, but you can't exactly change the core of yourself. Um, it's not that easy just to change your actions. You have to change your heart. You have to change your mind. You have to change your spirit. And I think that that's extremely relevant to the world that we're living in today and that we've been living in, right? Um, in the wake of uh, murders and protests, you have a lot of these organizations that put out these, these, uh, these you know, statements saying, we're listening, we understand, um, but they need to change their hearts first and then their actions to make sure that they correlate. Uh, in terms of that statement, you know, when I wrote the book, I began the book on the night of January 8th, uh, 2018, and I don't even write at night. 
it just hit me, the author's note, and it set the tone for the book. And that that part of this character, Wally Cat, who I didn't even know, just spoke to me. And uh, that's how I came up with that line. Darren seemed to change, right? So can yeah. you talk about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think Darren, some people say that when he becomes Buck, it's an alter ego, but it's not um, because his actions don't correlate with the person that we meet. Um, a lot of things happen to him and then he does a lot of things. Um, but at no point do I believe that his actual core changed. I think his core was always there, which is why he was able to go back and find himself um, despite all of the actions um, that he took. So yes, Darren changes, we all change every second. But I think there's a difference in, uh, a difference between the change in our actions and the change in our hearts and the cores of who we are. And someone itself is really selling nothing, right? Which is all a part of it. Sort of. Um, it's funny because people, people are like, wow, you know, I thought that you were never going to reveal what they actually sold. And I said, that would have been a great idea, an even bigger risk that uh, maybe I should have taken. But someone is selling something concretely. They're selling a therapy service to individuals so that they can connect with people of different faiths around the world to reach them in a way that um, psychiatrists or psychologists in their native countries may not be able to. But there is a juxtaposition of selling therapy and the way that it was sold, right? That didn't match up. It didn't fit. It was more like a, they were selling, you know, seats at a gambling table or something, right? Or a sporting event rather than a therapy session where you're soul searching. Yeah, I think it all just depends on, on who's selling what. Um, they're selling, like you're saying exactly, seats at a gambling table. Um, what, what we would refer to them in SaaS selling software as a service are licenses. So you're selling people access to a service. Um, but yeah, people sell things in different ways and, and some of them are aggressive, some of them are consultative, some of them are empathetic, just depends on who's selling. So you yourself are a salesman and uh, you've said that some of this is autobiographical. Which parts? Yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna answer that. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna leave it to the- Come reader. on, I was hoping for yeah. a tidbit. <laughs> no, I mean, and, and even me saying that I'm a, or someone saying that I'm a salesman right now, I'm not, in an organization selling a product, but I am selling myself and my point of view. And I believe that you, that you are a saleswoman, Rachel. I think that all of us are selling whether we know it or not. Um, but there are definitely parts in here that come from portions of my life. Um, not all of it, people sometimes ask me to quantify and I range like every time someone asks me that. Um, but what is truest to my own life are the feelings that are in this book, the feelings that the characters feel. Um, it was important for me to mine my own emotional uh, history to imbue them with feelings that rang true to me and hopefully the reader. And that feeling of being the only black person in the entire floor, on the entire company? That's just one feeling. There's many feelings. There's betrayal, there's love between Darren and his girlfriend, and there's a familial love between Darren and his mom. There are uh, people pitying other people. There's elitism. There is uh, mis miscalculations. Those are all things that I've experienced in my own life. There's also joy um, and triumph. Uh, this is one of my favorites. So the book is punctuated with little sort of indented uh, sales advice pieces, which I loved. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them, one of my favorites was, no matter how much it hurts, never let short-term frustration disrupt long-term gain. Sales is a marathon, not a sprint. Mm -hmm. Facts. <laughs> I love it. And then there was one, shoot, I didn't write it down, uh, that talked about, uh, you know, sort of the small pain, let it go, forget about it, right? Don't let it hurt yeah, you. Yeah. Always keep the big picture in mind. I love exactly, that. Exactly, yeah. Not, not living in uh, the short term. And that's something that's very central to sales because if you are uh, selling something, especially over the phone, and you're calling 100 or 200 people a day, it's very easy to get down on yourself when those 200 or so people never pick up or if they pick up, they tell you to F off or they don't give you the time of the day. And if you're focusing on those little losses, you're not gonna be able to thrive in that industry at all. Uh, there are all kinds of, as we said, there's dark comic scenes, racial slurs. Um, how hard was it to get this book published, to get it represented? It actually wasn't at all. And, and the racial slurs, right, um, they're, I don't even look at them as racial slurs because most of the time it's just, um, friends chatting, you know, and referring to each other, you know, it, it's not like in a derogatory manner, you know, so 
Um, and that's the way that just many of us speak with each other. So in terms of getting it uh, represented, it wasn't you know too hard. I mean, I had to work on multiple drafts and not every agent that I, I queried accepted it. But um, when I when I sent it to a, a handful of agents who saw what I was doing and who really understood the message of the book and my intentions, um, especially the woman who I signed with, um, it, it, it wasn't you know that difficult. And then when it came time to sell it, um, we, we pitched many people, we went on sub as the same industry as you know, you know, the many people and um, we were setting up many conversations, but the first person I spoke with was from my now publisher HMH. And my editors got the book so intimately um, that that was all I needed to hear. And then we just went with them. And they, they understand what, what I was trying to do. Um, so it wasn't a hard sell. And how long did it take to write the book? Yeah, so Black Buck was actually my third manuscript. The first two didn't go anywhere. I didn't get any representation from any agents. Um, those books are just shelved away. This book, I wrote the first draft in around five months, but it was super long. It was like 168,000 words. So we had to, you know, I had to work to cut it down on my own. And then when I got an agent, we worked on it. And then, of course, my editor, we cut it down. Um, but I'd say from the night I began writing it to when we sold it, around a year and eight or so months. Um, but in order to get into that shape before we sold it, maybe like a year and a half or so. That's still, that's fast. That's very fast. That's what I hear. Yeah, I mean, I really wanted to get the story out, honestly, as quickly as possible. Just, I'm not even saying published, but out of myself, because I didn't know how I was going to change over the course of years. And I wanted the book to retain its sense of energy and its verve. I love that. Um, and also, I think it's great for people to hear uh, that you have other books that didn't go anywhere. So do you think they'll ever go anywhere or they were sort of practice warm up? Those two books, I really look at them exactly, Rachel, as practice, um, whether I knew it or not at the time, those two books and what I learned from writing them, uh, because I don't have any formal writing background, I don't have my MFA or anything, those two books were my MFA um, and were the training ground. And I'm still learning every day. I have so much to learn. Uh, but without those two books, we wouldn't have this one. So what kind of advice do you have for new writers or aspiring writers? Well, I, I'd say... Um, and this is tough, but try not to overthink it, especially when you come to the page. You're there to write, to write. Um, what I, what, what is a priority for me is to get everyone else out of my head when I sit down to that blank word document. No agents, editors, uh, critics, reviewers, anyone like that. It's just myself and the story. So what I would say is uh, figure out how you can get into that headspace of, when, of where you're clear but also have a lot of energy and try to repeat that as often as possible. And if I could say one more thing, it's don't pay too much attention to the industry. That's not your job right now. Your job is to write something, I believe, that is true, that is exciting, and that is how you intend, to, uh, how you intend it to be. Everything else is just extra. So what is it that you want people to take away from Black Buck? It really depends on who's reading it, Rachel. For um, Black and Brown readers, I want them, especially if they've been in white majority workplaces, to know that they uh, are not alone, that they should never ever be made to feel less than, and that they have the right just as much as everyone else to chase success and in some cases achieve it. Um, for non-Black or Brown readers, um, I want them to read the book, of course, enjoy it, but I want them to also just ask themselves, what is my role um, in this narrative and in the larger narrative of this country and world um, and on the path to progress. So is there anything that I haven't asked you about that you would like to talk about or you'd like your readers to know? Well, Black Buck, uh, it's not an easy read. Um, what I tell people is that um, it's not a nice little journey. It's more so like a hostage situation. I don't let you go. The character doesn't let you go. And I'm hoping that even after you finish the last page that you're still thinking about the book. That said, it's not 400 pages of um, tragedy and trauma um, or doom and gloom. There is a lot of humor in there um, to lighten up the mood when necessary. And I hope that people can feel that. I definitely did. Mateo, I absolutely loved Black Buck. Thank you so much for joining me today. May you sell many, many copies. Thanks so much for your time, Rachel. Have a great day.